thank you very much for joining us. And um, uh, again, this is, I hope, a very informal discussion. Please feel free to interrupt me, ask a question at any time. Um, I'm going to start off. I'll, I'll, you know, I'm going to actually, I'm going to give you the standard GIM admissions uh, PowerPoint. You'll forgive me if you'll see some maybe common things that you might use in your own departments. But I think this is kind of a good place to start, and then we'll branch from there into uh, projects that we have been doing the last year, and then we're, and I'll talk about stuff that we're kind of um, uh, beginning right now. Uh, so I would say, like, when a lot of people um, ask me, like, how would you characterize GIM or what would you characterize what GIM is in relation to College of Innovation and Design? Um, so, so one of the things I'll, um, that I think the College of Innovation and Design does is um, what, what makes it different, I should say, from other colleges is it doesn't just do programs uh, or degrees because of course any college can do that. Um, what we are about uh, here is producing models, right? Um, maybe experimental models, which are a little bit harder to, to, to put into a larger college where things have, of course, a more uh, rigid structure and for good reasons, a rigid structure. Uh, so what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to explore how other models of operation might work, what we can do with them, um, how that um, you know, can be brought into the uh, experience of undergraduate students in our instance. Um, and then when I, when I talk about um, GIM itself, I think you know, one of the things I, I like to say is, I, I, what, I'll say this broadly, and you'll forgive, I, it's, it's a broad dichotomy, so of course I know there's, you know, it's a broad brush, but I, I will say, when you look across higher education as a whole, all around the United States and even beyond, I really think, I like to break down into, into kind of two models of operation that I sort of see. Uh, and one model I'll call is, is Mall of America. And what I mean by that is it's, it's a model that, uh, you know, like the Mall of America, it's kind of consumerist. Uh, everything looks really nice. Everything's sort of well laid out. Uh, but when you get into the mall, um, everything tends to be pretty cookie cutter, right? All the stores tend to be uh, the same and all of the, um, uh, you know, even though there's different things that they're selling, I would say the experience is very homogenized. And I think when I look across higher education, and I've worked at a number of universities now, there is a pull, right, towards this particular model. And it's, I think you see it in things where, where universities try to talk about, like, we have a sushi shop, or we have a rock wall, or we have all these other things that, that uh, you know, can attract the student to, to, to coming and being in, on campus. And although I don't think those are bad things, uh, I don't think that's what this generation of students is necessarily really looking for. And so, um, so again, I'll put my broad brush dichotomy there. I'll say on the other side, um, the other model that I think is operating, not just here, but in other places too, um, is what I'll call the Hogwarts model. And I'd say GIM fits inside that. That's the Hogwarts side of things. In a Hogwarts model, uh, you might go to a, a, you know, a dusty castle. Uh, it might not look the fanciest inside, but what you get is uh, cutting edge uh, activities and research. And, and beyond that, especially what you get is a sense of community, a way to, dis, you know, the feeling that you have a mentorship with your professors um, and, and a feeling that what you're doing while you're in the university has a purpose. Uh, and the purpose is, is bigger than you. You're part of something much larger. And, and I, I, I say all these things because this is really what GIM is about. And this is the kind of stuff that we're, we're sort of promoting. Uh, and hopefully as I kind of go through some of the projects and the things that we do, uh, that'll be kind of clear. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna start the PowerPoint. I'm just gonna skip around a little bit. Um, so I'll talk, you know, a lot of, one of the other things a lot of times you get questions on, what's the difference between GIM and computer science or CIS and other universities or so on and so forth. And what I usually say is, hey, those are all great disciplines. Um, I would say that the biggest difference comes in terms of the emphasis of what we're, we're trying to do. So I think we all are doing things that are very similar. Uh, it's just with, you know, uh, you know, computer science itself is a very broad, broad field, right? And you can, you know, it has a lot of different things happening inside of it. So this is a, this is a list. This is um, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, top 10 jobs. It changes with some regularity, but... Um, mobile app developer, video game designer, web developer. Um, but overarchingly, what I say GIM is doing is really um, promoting front-end development, meaning I, I would say that where our emphasis is, is how the human being is interacting with technology, 
what that interaction is like and being on the cutting edge of sort of what's emerging in that area. And when I talk about, you know, one of the things that, you know, you see this list here, I actually think we all see now that this list is even probably gonna be dated because I actually think we're seeing the emergence of, of something else. And that's gonna be on this next slide. Now you'll forgive me, I know this slide's hard to read. So I'll have to explain this more than you're probably able to see it. Um, so if we go back to that list, I think that what we're seeing emerge is another kind of a professional, uh, someone that I think will be called an extended reality developer. It's hard to say, it's still in flux, but basically someone who worries a lot about augmented and virtual reality experiences. And I'll also wrap internet of things within that because I, I believe that you really can't separate those, those three areas uh, very easily. And, and really I see this as sort of the, the future of where we're going. Um, the, the pie chart here, which is probably pretty hard for you to read, uh, but I'll kind of explain it. This actually comes from Goldman Sachs. This was done a few years ago. And this was a prediction and it ends up being one of the more conservative predictions of where just the augmented and virtual reality market um, is going. And so what Goldman Sachs said is that by uh, 2025, um, the AR and VR market uh, will be $80 billion a year. Now, of course, that's fluctuating. Um, and there are some who are like making much larger predictions of what that is. Um, if that's the case, wonderful. That just means things are better than we think they are. But even at $80 billion, that's pretty good. And uh, what you can't see in this pie chart here, when you look over, um, this, they did sort of a, a basic breakdown of what they thought that market might look like here in about another four years. And so this section right here, roughly a third of this pie chart is, is devoted to video games or games for entertainment. Uh, and the other two thirds of the, um, of the uh, pie are, are really devoted to industry simulations. So we have things like video entertainment, live events, um, engineering, healthcare, education, so on and so forth. And I always like to show this because I think, again, this kind of encapsulates GIMS curriculum uh, completely. I mean, we are, you know, games, interactive media and mobile. One third of our curriculum is very much devoted to games. Um, I would say um, not necessarily games for entertaining uh, as we teach in the curriculum, They're, they tend to be more serious games. Although of course the skills that are required for a game for entertainment or a, game, or a serious game are, are pretty much the same. Uh, and the other two thirds of our curriculum really deals with things like Internet of, um, Internet of Things, AR, VR, um, that we see um, being applied kind of towards industry. And, uh, and this is directly where we're going. Um, Let's see, I think I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit. Um, we've been actually fairly early into it. Actually, I was kind of messing around with AR, VR. Well, AR, augmented reality for sure, I was working with that, it'd be, over, it'd be 11 years ago now. Um, the VR was something I was beginning to work with when I came out of Wisconsin. And uh, when I first got here to um, Boise State, uh, this, um, uh, this led into one of the first projects. Now, initially this was done with myself and some of my alums out of Wisconsin, but uh, the second version was done directly with GIM students. So this project actually started in 2014 and GIM itself didn't start till 2015. Um, but what we did as um, nursing here on campus came to us. And I like to kind of start with this because I think it also uh, showcases how we think about working with clients, um, how our students interact and, and the kind of processes we take them through. <laughs> Uh, so nursing here on campus came to us with a really big problem um, at the time. Of course, they're nationally accredited simulation lab, one of the best certainly in this part of the country. Uh, at the time they came, they had 16 uh, medical mannequins uh, that the nursing students were working on, practicing various procedures on. Um, the cheapest of those mannequins was $15,000 and the most expensive was $65,000. And um, nursing's problem was that the faculty, and it's not just here at Boise State, this is kind of a standard um, around the world, they want their students to practice different procedures on the mannequin roughly 30 to 50 times before they do it on a human being. But at the time they came to me, I believe there was just shy of 500 nursing students in that program, and the reality of it was that wasn't happening. I mean, most of the nursing students were, were doing it four or five times and then, and then it was on to doing it um, on a person. And uh, that's, not, that's not an uncommon problem. In fact, 
Um, subsequently, we've, we work with a lot of universities from around the world. Everyone pretty much has a similar issue with this. So they said, you know, can you do something about this? And we said, well, what the heck, let's try. We had this very small internal grant uh, that came through uh, nursing as well as Office of Research here on campus. Um, back then it was Oculus Kit Dev Kit 1, <laughs> which, do any of you remember that? Yeah, a few do. Um, um, when I had been at Iowa State many years prior in my PhD program, I had a chance to um, work with, you know, what would be the cutting edge at that time, virtual reality caves that they have. Um, of course, that's still cutting edge research that's happening there. Um, but I remember the first time I put on Oculus Rift uh, Dev Kit 1, which is pretty crude in, in comparison to what we have today. Um, at that time, I think they were charging about $300 for it. I realized there's going to be a sea change here um, because they were able to provide a very close experience to the cave. And so I said, yes, let's try this thing. Um, so the nurses gave us, uh, <clears throat> we said, okay, what do you want us to do? Which, you know, what kind of a training procedure do you want us to go through on this? And uh, they, um, they said, um, well, let's, let's take catheter insertion. Now, catheter insertion never comes up, right? That's not a topic of conversation that just ever appears anywhere, but it probably should because 20% uh, of all secondary infections come from that procedure alone. So people die every day because of mistakes that are, that are made. And the mistakes that are made are commonly, you know, um, procedure mistakes, right? Or, or muscle memory mistakes, or just basically breaking sterile procedures. And, 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 uh, and then of course that puts the, the patient in danger. And so we said, okay, let's take it on. Uh, so when you're looking at this is a very early, this is our first version of this thing. Um, you're looking at, that's actually now uh, Oculus Red Dev Kit 2. They were moving pretty quickly from when we started. Um, you might notice over on the picture here, there's two bands of, uh, uh, that are on the forearm. Those are, are Mio's. Um, so they went right here. Those were not ours. Those were, uh, but again, I, I like to show this because this is exactly how GIM works. We look around like what's the cutting edge user interface technology that's going on. This was at that time. What the Mio did is it um, was you put on your forearm and it would read your muscle movements and it would be able to translate that pretty accurately into what kind of a grip you were doing, right? Or which fingers you were having up. Uh, it wasn't absolutely perfect, but it was pretty close. Uh, and so we said, this is, this is something we should probably try. Now you notice that uh, Sam is also wearing a set of gloves there. Those are gloves that we made. So that's also one of the things, you know, um, GIM is a very creative curriculum, both on visual design side and programming side. And I guess you would say, I guess a little bit of engineering side there. Um, those gloves have, uh, what we did is we took a pair of standard gloves. Uh, I think we bought them at Home Depot. And uh, we sewed basically conductive um, fabric and thread into them. We use an Arduino. And so we were able to capture some of the more fine motor movements in the hand, because in order for this thing to be effective for nursing, it couldn't just be when, like what VR was when it first started, just sort of a visual experience. It had to also have this haptics uh, associated with it that we needed to bring into it. Um, and so um, we used the meals, we used our gloves, and then uh, you don't see it, but there's a connect camera in front of Sam. Um, that kind of uh, captures the full body movement uh, and then translate this, uh, this into the game. And here I'll, I'll give you a sense of how this works. So this is an actual film of uh, the first field trials really that were done here at Boise State. Um, and again, I think this showcases how, how GIM works. So we take on creative stuff. You're gonna see down here in the lower right hand, this is the 3D environment that we create. So GIM as a major self transdisciplinary um, deep dives in object-oriented programming, deep dives into two and 3D modeling and animation, and then of course, then usability, right? Uh, so this environment is created. Um, this is a nursing student. Now you'll see in this first iteration that um, there's still a lot of wires attached to it because this is our Arduino still, right? Um, in our second version that we made, we got rid of all of that. So I'll let you kind of watch this. And I, I'm sorry if it's, I don't know how easy it is for you guys to see this on your side. I hope it's clear enough. Um, so you can see that the nursing student is making natural movements uh, and those movements are translated pretty accurately into that environment. Uh, and there are a lot of things that we sort of discovered along the way as we first started to do this. So you might notice in a second um, um, as she's moving this over, first of all, you'll see right there, I'll stop it. Um, there's no body, 
there's just a forearm and hands. Actually, what was interesting, originally we had put a body on the, on the nurse, uh, a nursing uh, avatar, I should say. We found, however, that, that made it really hard. The human brain just does not want to accept that that is your body um, when it's, when there's, you know, can look down and see something like that. Um, we found that when we took the body out and we just went to forearms and hands, um, it made the process of, of having your brain accept that those are your hands or at least a good substitute for them much, much easier. Um, and so you can see that as I'll, I'll run this, I'll keep running this, I should say, you can see as she's going through this sort of an environment, um, she's picking up, she's moving naturally, uh, she is performing the procedure. Um, we're getting this binocular view, obviously, because this is how um, Oculus used to capture it, but of course she's in a VR space, she's seeing it as a, as a 3D room. Uh, and she's interacting with this kit. Now, in the process of doing this, obviously we work pretty directly with the nursing faculty, uh, first here at Boise State and then later from people around the world. We, we began to you know, talk to them about, you know, what, what do you need, figuring out the procedures, uh, so on and so forth. Um, when we played this the first time, uh, it, it took a while, um, even, you know, even with, with students that were fairly um, comfortable in gaming, it took them about 20, 25 minutes the first time to play the game to really, I guess I would say their brain to, to accept that this is the reality that they should be working in. But then what we saw after that was a, was a pretty steep decline in the amount of time it took to, to play the game. By the second or third uh, go through, a lot of the students were down to about seven minutes. Um, we've published on this a number of places. If you want, I can certainly make those articles available to you. Um, uh -huh. I, I have a quick question. Can, can you just explain what, what exactly this person is doing? Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. Yes, I'll pause it. So she's yeah, a, I, I, <laughs> he is conducting a, a catheter insertion procedure on a medical mannequin. And she, what she has in front of her there is a kit. It's the standard kit that, that nurses use for, um, for the catheter kit, essentially. And what she is doing is she's moving through the process of taking um, items out of the kit. There's a very, so when they're teaching the nursing students how to do it, there's a very prescribed way, step, 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 step. And there's also a series of um, things that they really have to be aware of in terms of like not putting their gloves in certain places, because once they break sterility, um, that's where the problems come. That's where those secondary infections come. And so we actually reinforce that. We gamify it, so to speak, in that if the nursing student here um, does touch something that is that is not sterile, then we would show visually like little little green bacteria kind of falling from the glove. And of course, we track those those issues too internally. Um, I I felt that was, there was a lot of discussion actually when we first got into it, like, do we actually want to show them, you know, maybe want to catch them at the end and tell them that they didn't do a good job, but actually it worked better the other way. It, I, it, um, you know, showing them right away that, Hey, you, you broke, you've broken sterility, even though it kind of, it ends the game because you got to stop at that point. Um, it, let's just say, I think that was a great way for teaching the kind of the muscle memory that the students had to have to, to know best what to do. Uh, the advantage of the system, too, is that um, it could uh, basically, in this instance, you can see here, it's going into a 10 by 10 office, um, uh, a blank office, you know, just, you know, no other furniture. Um, a nursing student, so if we had like a, a building here on campus that was open 24 hours a day, a nursing student could go in, they could sign in, they could say, I'm here you know, um, this class, so on and so forth. They could do as many of the procedures as they would like. Uh, and then we could record that and give it back to the professor and say, you know, this student was in, here are the problems that they have. Uh, and of course, we can provide a, a number of other measures too, such as, is there a trend? Like, is it just one person who's having difficulty in this part of the procedure? Or does the whole class seem to have this problem? Is that an indication maybe we need to cover something further in class or just revisit things, so on and so forth? Um, this entire system delivered, software and hardware, uh, was about $8,000. So it beat the price of the cheapest medical mannequin by half. That's one of the reasons why we won the National Wow Award from WCET for this one. Now, um, we took this, uh, so this so this was done, as I said before, this started with some alumni that I had from Wisconsin because GIM wasn't really kind of in existence. But um, as this project was progressing, my and as I started to have students come on, this game was first going. Um, obviously, they eased into the project, 
And we actually took this project to a second version. Uh, we began development on that project in 2016. Um, and that one we also took to an international field trial. So we worked with a number of universities from Australia, um, uh, Canada, around the United States. Um, and um, one of the things, um, of course, and this is technology, right? This is how technology sort of, you know, develops, um, things sort of move. And actually, if you'll forgive me, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing for one second because I'm gonna show you what part of that second version looked like. Um, so we were we were happy with what we had seen um, from the um, you know from the first field trial. However, we felt that we could do a better job. And actually, here I'll show it. One second, folks. Just let me get over to it. There we go. Sorry, small connection with my job or with my uh, internet. There we go. Okay, so now I'll come back and share. Oh, sorry, I see there's stuff coming out in, in, in chat. My so I apologize, that's it's off. I haven't had a chance to look at that, but I'll, I'll come try to come back and revisit. So, um, um, here we go. So I said that we done the first um, iteration of it, but um, and actually during that first iteration, we had looked at a camera called Leap Motion, which we really liked. You might, some of you might know it. It's a really small camera, basically has a lidar sensor um, that can catch um, motor movements. When it first came out, it, you know, as as often happens, right? The technology has a lot of big promise, and they have these you know big promo uh, videos that they put out saying, "Hey, this can do this," and uh, and then you you buy the technology and you you realize well, not quite yet. And so that was our experience doing it on the first version. We we were actually excited to take on Leap Motion, um, but they weren't quite there yet. But by the second version, they were. And so this is um, what we began to do is we began to use. Um, we wanted to basically make the second version cheaper and easier. So in the first version, you still had to have a, a um, you know. A, uh, an office space that was sort of available. We wanted something that could be practiced just in a standard computer lab, or at least uh, at least a lab that had multiple machines in it. Um, here's what that looked like. Okay. All right, I'm doing video too here now. There you see the little green dots flying. <laughs> You're not sterile until the until the gloves are on. But you see the movements are fairly, you know, again, this is 2016. Um, well, even a standard Oculus Rift. Well, I shouldn't say that. The Quest is now got gesture-based recognition, which is up to this level. So we were able to reproduce this system, um, uh, and uh, we were. This is the one that we took to international field trial. This is the one that we distributed basically to the universities around uh, Australia, Canada, United States, and um, uh, this system delivered hardware, software combined, five thousand dollars, and uh, it could go into a mostly standard computer lab. I think you get the idea. So I'll stop sharing that. Um, and I, I like to show this again, this is how GIM works, right? So um, one of the things again, we maintain very deep hardware libraries. Um, we are interested in new things that are coming out. A lot of times we'll buy something that we think is, um, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of just coming out. Nobody knows a lot about it. Why don't we take a look at it? We'll see sort of what's going on. Um, we experiment with it. If we can figure it in or work it into a project, all the better. Um, and 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 kind of um, come to an understanding of sort of doing something like that, I think helps us have a better understanding of what's possible, kind of what the next steps are in terms of 
technology and where all this is going. So again, uh, we had students flying to Boise. Uh, I should say we had faculty flying to Boise from uh, around the world uh, to train with our students and to train with the faculty, the nursing faculty and staff here at Boise State um, on this system. And we, again, published a number of articles on it. I can certainly make you, I can certainly make those uh, links aware, um, available to you if you'd like to. Uh, and again, this is GIM. Um, and so, um, you know, coming back to what I was saying earlier, GIM's model uh, or GIM's approach to things, um, when the students come in, it's a cohort. It's a cohort, they meaning we, we like our students to sort of come in and take the same set of classes um, pretty much inside of a, a straight line. Now, the reason we like this uh, for a few different reasons. Number one, because we are combining so many different areas of knowledge, whether it's two and 3D design, object jointed programming, various game engines, so on and so on, um, uh, it, it's, it makes it kind of necessary to have a pretty good idea where students are at at any one time, right? And so if we had a series of electives, um, we would probably have a student body that was a, um, had a, a, we'll call it a, a wider mix of skills that would be harder uh, because as we get to the end of our um, GIM curriculum, we move to these large capstone projects where we're working with clients um, and uh, you know, the students need to have had exposures at certain times to various things so they're able to do that um, effectively. And, uh, and again, this is GIM's kind of experimental curriculum where we, um, we're always sort of probing around to see what's next. Um, now, in doing all this, and, and I had, we had, I had doing some of this work prior in Wisconsin as well, but in doing this, um, there's another, you know, I talked about, um, you know, I think in my abstract, or my, uh, I talked about basically 21st models, 21st century models of service learning and technology. So one of the other things that um, uh, really is emphasized in GIM, something that I say to the students quite a lot, um, uh, I think very often it's common, um, again, this is across higher education and beyond that even, when, um, when students are, you know, in STEM educations or, or, or uh, technically based majors are discussed with students, um, a lot of times, you know, one of the lead things that's um, brought out is, you know, well, this is a great career, which it is, it is, we all know that. But, um, but I think it's couched too much in terms of money. And although, of course, yes, these are, you know, they are good paying careers and there's, you know, plenty of opportunity in it. Um, I'll be honest, in, in GIM, I think we have the philosophy that um, if everything's about money, nothing's worth a dime. And so one of the first, or not one of, well, no, actually, one of the first things we also want to teach the students is um, you are learning a set of highly uh, uh, prized skills. Obviously, these will give you a life uh, and a career which will, you know, be fulfilling for you. But if that's all it is, it's not enough. You have to also be someone who's willing to look at the world around you and to use the things that you have to, to do better, you know, to make it a better place to be. And so we emphasize that a lot with the students and um, we emphasize it obviously with service learning projects internal to um, uh, two classes and whatnot that are running in GIM. Uh, but GIM also runs a, a, another structure, um, which is, I'll call it, uh, it's, it's, it's GIM Dev Team, or actually it's called GIM Works. And so one of the other things that um, we started to do early on uh, for the very first year is we started to try to make connections with uh, uh, various um, industry, government, and foundational partners, which would allow us to um, continue to explore technology, continue to explore the cutting edge of technology, but do so in a way that um, that would benefit and especially benefit groups that may not normally have access to these things or, or that, um, you know, that software studios and whatnot, you know, wouldn't address because they'd have, you know, some big contract from someplace asking them to do, a, you know, a game or something like that. And, and, uh, and this is a need that although technology could address it, uh, it never happens. And so this has been a, a pretty successful program. So I'm gonna switch off a little bit. And I'm gonna to start to show you some of the projects that Dev Team is doing. Uh, currently we employ roughly 30 students inside of Dev Team. Uh, Pre-pandemic, it was closer to 40. Uh, 
um, uh, we pay, I pay $15, uh, we start at $15 an hour, we go up to $20 an hour for our, our students. Um, all of that money is raised through uh, uh, grants and soft donations. So I work with uh, uh, a, a local foundation here in town, which is guaranteed, uh, basically guaranteed significant sums of money to take on community projects that um, we think have a high tech solution. Um, but we also work with government, uh, both state and local. We also work with other state governments, not just Idaho. Um, and I'll tell you about a project we have ongoing here towards the end um, where we're reaching out right now across the state of Idaho to our middle and high schoolers, um, helping them to maybe see some of the same things that I was just describing with you. So uh, again, I'll start to story some projects, but let me, um, let me step back to two and and kind of say um, one of the other interesting things that we see. So I'm going to, I have some VR projects I'm going to show you. We are obviously we like VR a great deal, but now I'm going to switch over to more AR projects uh, because um, what we see, probably what you see as well, um, AR is definitely the next web. And uh, uh, we've had the opportunities to work with some of the representatives from Apple on this. Of course, they don't tell us anything, but you can see in the latest products that they're emerging with, with, you know, the iPhones and the iPad Pros, the LiDAR sensors and whatnot, you know, there's a, there's definitely a movement amongst the major players. Um, and we also understand that that is not just simply going to be a visual game, uh, meaning that there will probably be a series of sensors um, I'll call them Internet of Things sensors, although maybe that term will change too, which will um, knit together in, in providing us the kind of very complex experiences that I think AR is going to allow us to do. Oh, hold on one second. I got a question. I'm so sorry. Matthew, was the decision to go with just forearms and hands arrived at? But yes. Well, we read, a, this is 2014, so there wasn't a lot out there. We read a little bit about it, but um, it was, yeah, it was kind of real honest, to be honest, it was trial and error. Yeah, we, we got rid of it. Um, we got rid of it um, for another reason. We thought it would kind of speed some of our development process. And the minute we did, we just realized like, wow, this is going a lot faster for people, more comfortable. That was a great question. Thank you, Matthew. All right, so, um, and if I've missed it, I'm sorry, there's a few other, ch I, I didn't have my chat open. If I've missed another question that might be earlier, just, you know, type it out again. I'll try to address it. So coming back to what I was sort of saying, um, the next kind of, the next things that we're doing inside of YEM um, are looking to see what is the shape of this new um, web that will emerge, a mixed reality web, probably more AR than VR, again, probably with a strong component of IoT um, and obviously AI and, um, and big data as a part of it. Um, so I think what I'll do, yeah, I'll do this one. So I'll have to endure a commercial, or maybe not. No, we'll have to endure a commercial. One second, folks. I'll let the commercial go by. So one of the, as, as this is happening, one of the other things that we are committed to, so what I said is, you know, if everything's about money, nothing is worth a dime, you know, so, uh, so, when we take on projects, one of the things we want to do is take on projects, again, where the technology definitely has a purpose and can do something, but we want to help people who don't have the access or the money or, or whatever that might be to, to sort of make this work uh, well. And so here's one of our projects. I'll, sure, I'll show this. We've had a number of news stories run on us. You might have seen it. I think we got like a couple dozen out there now. Um, can you all see the making the grade? Is that appearing? nod, let me know, put a thumbs up, whatever. Are we good? Oh, thank you so much, Matthew. Um, so this is a project actually that we took on about a year ago. It just is in the Apple store. Now it was put, actually, it was one of the first on January 1st. Um, and we're beginning a field trial with it right now in the Boise school districts within two weeks. Um, this is a project that initially it started off to use augmented reality um, to help children on the autism spectrum better understand handwriting. In the process, we work with special, edu special education teachers, occupational therapists, and, and a number of other um, experts in the field who uh, were giving us really great advice about sort of how to pursue it. Um, uh, they have told us um, as it was developing and as we were doing some of our initial field trials that um, yes, we'll help children on the spectrum, but probably it also has a much wider use as well, which was we were very happy about. Um, this is part of our larger goal. So in GIM, one of the things that, that we, you know, it's, 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 
it's not enough just to have like, well, here's some lofty goal. We want to do good in the world. Um, we, we have very specific things that we're trying to accomplish in the short term, midterm and long term. One of the goals that we have for midterm is to double or triple the amount of occupational speech and physical therapy that's delivered in our schools. Um, I don't think anyone is surprised by this. Certainly if you talk to a teacher, they're not surprised by this. The therapy and the therapists and the special education teachers who work in our schools are great, excellent, right? Um, that's not the issue, especially with therapy. The issue is um, children need help and they don't get enough. There's just not enough time. And so we're looking at ways to um, magnify essentially the efforts that the, uh, that the teachers and the therapists are doing to help children um, to help children get uh, the kind of skills that they need. So this is, a, uh, like I said, this, this is early on. Uh, it's in the store now. If you want to check it out, it's only for iPad. Um, uh, but here you can see sort of where it's developing. This is a big concern across Idaho with half of the kids entering Idaho kindergarten unable, unable to identify more than 11 letters in the alphabet. A group of students are helping kids prepare for the classroom with new technology. Six on your side's Jessica Taylor shows us how augmented reality could improve reading and writing in tonight's Making the Grade. Anthony the Ant is throwing a surprise party for Francine the Fly. Students will soon be able to turn their real lives into a storybook while learning to write inside of it. The augmented reality is like bringing something into our world. Virtual reality is bringing us into another world. And what this is doing is it's placing the child inside of their own story. Um, so they get to see this story kind of evolve in front of them and play a part in it. Students in the GIM lab are developing an app that teaches children to write. So we're going to trace a line here. With specialized art and progress tracking that helps children with developmental delays or on the autism. Spectrum. You track all the data. We'd like to be able to present it for teachers and occupational therapists. The app creates a profile for each student that teachers can monitor. It can even help predict if a child is likely to develop carpal tunnel syndrome for how they hold the pencil. We can pinpoint those kinds of things so that teachers can, when they start working with their student, um, they can just sit down and know exactly what <laughs> they're struggling with. Awareness of written materials and writing skills are kindergarten common core state standards. Across the state, schools are lacking therapists, which is often how students receive handwriting help. One of the things we want to do is to increase the amount of um, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and, and other kinds of therapies that, are, that the schools are offering right now. We realize that that's difficult sometimes with budgets. More and more classrooms have iPads as part of their classroom materials. So this is a more cost-effective effort to increase occupational therapy for handwriting. The program, once completed, will be available across iPads and phones so students can access it at home. Jessica Taylor, six on your side. So one second, oh, here, I'll close that. Um, so again, that's, that's released as of January 1st. We actually also just released two weeks prior to that. We were working um, in tandem on a uh, project to um, increase literacy for children who are deaf. Um, <laughs> yes, they do. They learn all the whole alphabet, Donna. <laughs> um, uh, in that particular project, for the one for literacy for the deaf, we worked with uh, a variety of state uh, therapists and officials from the state of Georgia. And uh, the goal with that one was um, a, a child who is profoundly deaf and whose first language is sign language. Sign language is so grammatically different from written and spoken language that it, it can be sometimes a struggle to make that transition. Uh, and so there's a curriculum that's been created that essentially helps um, uh, helps students to do that. Um, that curriculum for many years was delivered by a, a paper and it was literally six boxes, like huge boxes of paper. It costs, uh, I think it costs almost like $700 to, to print it all out and get it all available for students. And, and we said, um, we can make that into a mobile app. We can gamify it. Um, we can take some of the concepts from your lessons and gamify them. We can make them things that will help the students um, uh, learn better and access um, your materials better because, uh, you know, they're not having to worry about, am I going to get a piece of paper from the teacher? That was also released. I should mention that both the ABC Stories and the um, uh, Foundations of Literacy for the Deaf also have a unique structure around them. Um, as you can tell, we're, we are recording student data. 
that of course has certain FERPA considerations that are clear and present around that. Um, and so one of the things that we also had to explore and uh, create was a custodial bridge. Um, so we work with a company um, here in town. Um, so again, our students created everything. We have all the back end, uh, all that set up, but we never actually saw any student data. Once the apps were created, uh, we gave them to Blocksmith, who was our custodian, uh, and Blocksmith um, administers that. Um, Boise State, of course, still is the, the originator of it and controller of this, those ideas. But um, uh, we have a firewall, essentially, in terms of, 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 of FERPA data that um, is important because I think we all know, too, that, you know, that's a, that's a big consideration for schools for very good reasons, and we definitely want to follow those guidelines. Now, I know I'm looking at my time. I, I want to be, I want to be um, respectful. Um, I have maybe one or two more things I'll show, but you guys tell me. You know, you've, got, you've, got, you've got at least 10, 15 minutes. Well, very good. Well, thank you very much. So I think, you know, the next thing I'll show you, um, this is a project that I'll show you a VR project. Um, let's see here. This was done last year. This, this project actually exists right now in the, um, uh, uh, in the, the uh, public uh, libraries here in town. One second, I want to get the right one for you. There's been a couple stories on, but one's better. There we go. That's the one I want. So we'll have to we'll probably have an ad here too. I'll let that go. Um, I like to show this one because um, I think a lot of times VR is. Um, uh, we think of it as 3D models, which of course is what we we work with. Um, but there is another type of VR, um, I think gaining in popularity, certainly it's used, um, which uses a 360 video camera. Uh, so this particular solution does that. One second, now we're here. Okay, I'm gonna stop this. Um, and I'll share a screen here. Um, so what happened was this is the mayor, uh, Boise came to see us and said, we have a, we have a problem. Um, we have a, an event called Wings for Autism, which happens at the Boise Airport. It's a wonderful event, wonderful event. And what it does is it, um, for children on the spectrum and others who might have sensory overload going to the, to the airport, um, it allows for kind of a, we'll call it a walkthrough before they um, actually have to fly so that they are more comfortable with all the things that are going on. No, it's a wonderful event, very good people. But the trouble is it happens once a year. And so what we got asked for is like, can you make something that would be, you know, maybe available for a parent at any time that they need it um, so that you know, we, they can have that experience and we can make that a, a, you know, a great experience going on a, on a trip. And we said, sure. This one we did pro bono. A look around. The students filmed inside the Boise Airport with the actual employees to help kids on the spectrum feel more comfortable. And they spent the past few weeks editing it all together. You will feel like a small child going through the airport. The airport can be an overwhelming experience, especially so for children with sensory issues. For a child on the spectrum, one of the things I think they, they struggle to understand are sort of the, the rules of the environment. And so they're overwhelmed by all these things that are coming in, the sights and the sounds. Students are working on a VR experience that walks a child through the Boise airport. Here the TSA agent is explaining that uh, unfortunately we can't see exactly what's in the bag so we need to pull the suitcase aside and go through from every angle so really we're shooting six videos at once and then we have to take those videos and then stitch them all together the Boise Airport already has an event called wings for autism where children on the spectrum can get a practice run at boarding a plane but that's just one day this technology can help kids on all the other days of the year this allows other children within the community to use this technology to be able to go through that experience virtually so the next time they fly it's more of a familiar environment and it'd be a less stressful for them. Gim Lab students also reach out to medical professionals to see how to make their technology most effective. There is a growing need for uh, virtual learning and uh, virtual therapy environments in the healthcare industry. Uh, I'm father of a child with Down syndrome so I definitely see that there's a need for more of these extra programs and Boise State is working on it. So much more than just video games now, but uh, a realm that can really, truly help people. 
Um, one second here. I love that project. You know how committed the Boise State, uh, or excuse me, the Boise Airport people were and, and the city of Boise, we are so well served by these people. They, we, we filmed that after the airport was closed. And, and, and they had all, they had like people, of course I had some of our students there and they had their staff there, you know, acting like people going through the airport. I mean, they stayed until the wee hours of the night to get that done. And uh, I, I feel that that was uh, a testament. I think it's a testament to our community. And I think that as a learning experience for everybody involved it is, um, it's very useful, very, very useful. Um, I'll show you one more thing. Uh, and this, I, you know, I mentioned Internet of Things. This one I'll show, uh, you might have heard of this one. This is Bronco Beam. We have a lot of different apps run at one. <laughs> Sorry, KTVB, this is KTVB. Their ads on KTVB are, I mean, they, you've got to watch the ad. They, they just, they don't give you, they don't give you any, um, um, any choice there. Um, so at any one time, uh, usually GIM, uh, like I said, right now we have about 30 students working. GIM teams are generally working on about four, three to four projects at any one time. Um, all of these are with clients. Um, half of the clients are generally at distance, meaning out here in Idaho. Uh, again, good practical experiences for really what will be, you know, uh, a common thing when they get into their careers. Um, the other thing, of course, they're getting from this strong portfolio artifacts. Um, I want to talk about this technology. I, I have, we have, I have lot, many others I'd show, but this, this is the last one. And you might have seen this story too. This is Bronco Beam. Oh, no, hold on. The survey shows that close to half of the students at Boise State describe themselves as food insecure. At the same time, events on campus often have leftover food that goes to waste. And it sounds like those two problems could probably help each other out. Our Joe Paris is in studio to explain how some Boise State students are working to help students in need while preventing waste. Joe? Gretchen, a team of talented students has already worked hundreds and hundreds of hours over the last two years to develop a smartphone app to help with problems of waste and need on their campus. Pretty much universally, everyone I tell them about this idea gets excited. The root of that excitement is found here on a smartphone. This is Bronco Beam. So Bronco Beam actually stands for Beacon Environment Approximation Mapping. We're just getting started. The app was developed by a team of students working in the GIM lab at Boise State. It lets students on campus know if catered events have extra food when they're over. It tells you what the food is, where it is, and how long it'll be available. The app solves two problems on campus. Students who are food insecure now have new options for free meals and food services now has people to give extra food to instead of just throwing it away. You know, I think every college student has a like, dream of doing something that's actually gonna be impactful in the real world instead of just kind of like a study. Um, and I gotta say, this is a perfect example of that. Sitting there and my phone buzzes and tells me that it's free food in the sub, that was super cool just to see that happen and see that it's actually working how we wanted it to. While the team was talking me through how the app works, an alert came in from Bronco Beam. Oh, uh, there it is. Yeah, it's on your salad and rolls. So we decided to take a walk over to the student union building where a fresh meal was waiting. Shortly after the alert went out, students were taking advantage of the food that otherwise would have been thrown away. It's been great. We've started having events, seeing people come and actually take advantage of it. And we're excited to see it grow. And that's already happening and fast. When we checked yesterday, we had gone from 200 beta testers um, to about six or 700 users in about two days. For the team of Olivia Thomas, Isaac Herrero, and Tyler Chapman, this app has also opened up their eyes to new possibilities. Also see that what we're making can actually at least make a small dent in that problem, if nothing else. And the Bronco Beam app is out now. Um and uh it was very popular I, I i can't tell you how many current users we have um well, i'm gonna stop share here um actually um of course in pandemic it's not quite the same issue um but um let me explain just a little bit about that app and then um then i'll end with this that app actually came out of an earlier project it uses a combination of bluetooth beacons and um and geofencing and uh, initially, it was actually Dr. Custer came to us and said, we need a way, can you give us some ideas for maybe having better retention on campus? And so uh, I had had, I had done a little bit of this work prior at UWSP. And so I, I, the idea that I kind of pushed back was, 
you know, you have all these students who are coming into these large lecture bowls that, you know, are probably nervous, especially if they're coming from a small town and, you know, you want them to come to these tutorial sessions, but they don't know if they should or if it's valuable. And so it, in the early version of this project, what we did is we, we put Bluetooth beacons into some of the key um, uh, uh, tutorial rooms on campus. Chemistry was the one we were shooting for at that point. And um, when you walked into the room, basically we were able to pay, like if you walked into the room, like I got a question, I'm having trouble with this. We could guide you to someone across the room who had the same question or even better guide you to someone in the room who had figured it out and said, Hey, you know what? I'm willing to help with it. And so we felt that that was a way of sort of building community. Now, what we saw there, once we built that, um, they came, uh, we had dining services and uh, a few others on campus came over to us and said, we have a big problem. And you, I think we're probably aware of this. Catered meals on campus when we had such a thing, um, uh, there's usually a lot of food left over. And, and regulations state that um, that food has to be thrown within 30 minutes of the end of that meal. So it does no good to send, you know, a big broadcast message to someone if they're 10 miles away, they're not going to get there in time to take advantage of it. So in that instance, we use combinations of beacons and geofencing to, uh, to, to basically know if someone within a few hundred yards of this and then to guide them to where that food was being um, given away. I think we had over a couple thousand users uh, before all this goofiness hit. And I, I suspect Actually, I don't have to suspect. I know this because we have some meetings with food banks right now. Um, that problem is not going to go away. And what we're working on, I'm, what I'm hoping we'll be able to do is translate that technology into a wider effort to feed the people of Idaho because the problem is big now. Very big. Uh, it's kind of, I, I think it's not, perhaps we're not like Texas where you have the hours and hours of lines of cars, but we definitely have an issue. And uh, our students are going to take it on. We're going to solve it. Well, we're going to solve part of it. What we can solve. 